Once we realized what was happening, we started making steps. There we were in Paris, the city of lights, sauntering leisurely along the right bank of the Seine. We had just finished our 40th anniversary meal at uh, Maison La Serrée. And I was caught somewhere between gastronomic and marital bliss. <laughs> when all of a sudden, John, our youngest son, sent me an SOS. I picked up my phone and it read, Dad, are you okay? I've heard bad things about Paris. Well, I looked up and noted that, well, come to think of it, the boulevards in that area, which are usually replete with tourists and with residents, were eerily empty. It was then that we started making steps quickly back to the hotel. And as we neared the hotel, what we encountered was unsettling, to say the least. Platoons. Platoons of SWAT teams and policemen and uh, combat soldiers uh, were everywhere you looked. And sirens filled the air all through that marvelous city. The jocular pedestrians that had been our company on the way to the restaurant were replaced by stern-faced women and men and black outfits carrying ominous automatic weapons. The, second, the next night well, ended up being even worse. Thinking we were safe in the citadel of our, of our prominent hotel, nestled there next to the lights of the Eiffel Tower, I felt pretty safe and Kay and I fell into a deep slumber. Only to be awakened at 2 a.m. by Tom and Ann Berger, our traveling companions, who were also celebrating their 40th. Tom said to the receiver, Pat, our hotel is on TV. <laughs> Oh boy! <laughs> I turned on NBC Europe, and sure enough, as they're showing all the stuff going on in Paris, there's one of those banners that goes across. It wasn't giving college football scores. Uh, it said, "It said the Hotel Pullman Eiffel Tower has just received a terrorist threat." Unbeknownst to K and B, just below us on the bottom floor, the SWAT team had encircled the restaurant and bar and lobby and marched all of the patrons down to the basement and made them get down on their knees and stay that way so that they did not they did not pose a very large silhouette for the terrorist gunman. On our floor, Ann Berger, ever curious, happened to open her door to see a young, beautiful mother, like the beautiful mothers in this congregation, with a, with a bundle in her arms. She was making steps towards Anne in almost a run. As she neared Anne, she extended the bundle and said, please, take my baby, take my baby. Such was the fear in that place at that time. And I will have to admit to you, I was pretty scared myself. But the strange, the strange conundrum that played in my head over and over again even surprised me. Being wed to, the, to an immeasurably modest woman for 40 years, I could not get out of my head how in the world I was going to get her out of that hotel in my head. <laughs> I know that's not really 007 thinking, but that's what's going in my head. I could see me rescuing her in her nightgown only to be uh, unmarried the next day. You know? <laughs> but such was the, the ocean we were swimming in uh, at that time, and fear was replete uh, everywhere. Um, you know, I have to say to you, just as a aside, in order to top the fireworks of our 40th, Kay and I will have to go to South Sudan for a few <laughs> That's okay. Tell Daniel and Janet said they'll go with us. So, <laughs> you know, as we got there, once we got on the boat and started heading south uh, into France and Provence and other places, 
the tension began to lessen. But I could not get one question out of my head. It just kept on reverberating in, in my brain. And that was, has the world really come to this? I mean, really, has the world really come to this? Has humanity become so depraved, so twisted, so godless, that we will indiscriminately execute young people reveling at a concert, and at the same time, the very same moment, execute sweethearts and families merrily eating their supper <coughs> at uh, a sidewalk cafe in Paris. Have we really fallen so, so far? Jesus warned us. I wish I'd pay better attention, but he, he says very explicitly in his word, and it's read on this fun first Sunday of Advent, um, the distress among the nations will grow to a constant fevered pitch. So it will be like the sea and the waves, and people will faint from fear. Pay attention to the victory, Jesus says. When you see that it puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Just so, just so. When you see these things occurring, you know that the kingdom of God has come here. In the face of this distress, I dare say that I think most of us in this room are paralyzed along two poles, fear and ignorance. I believe that's where most of us are. On the one hand, we observe we observe the world in which we are set with such disbelief and such horror that we are frozen. We don't know what to do. On the other hand, we're like, we're like, that, we're like that man in that, in that hotel room with his wife in his nightgown, not knowing how in the world he'll make an exit from that place, not being able to make steps anywhere. On the other hand, we just giddily go, on, go along the same routines, endlessly entertaining ourselves into numbness. Not realizing that all the while the earth is shaking beneath our feet. <coughs> Observing this, I want to make just three points. The first is this, and this will not surprise anyone in this room. And that is, we are set in a world which is increasingly dark. Now this really isn't completely new news. I mean, the very moment we reached out for that alluring fruit on the forbidden tree and pulled and yanked that fruit off, we enthroned ourselves as God. And once we enthrone ourselves as God, we're the measure of all things, right? Once we make ourselves God, we are the arbiter of all that's, all that's right and wrong. We are, we can determine, we can determine uh, what things pass muster and what things don't. There is no external authority in our life. And when that happens, when we do that, the gloves are off. The gloves come off. And we're capable of anything. We're capable of anything. We can denigrate the family. We can rape the earth. We can kick the knee. We can ratify our greed. We can ignore the elderly. We can endlessly entertain our libido. And ultimately, we can exterminate our neighbors. Now, I hope you will know there's not one thing I added to my little list that were not included in the Big Ten given to Moses at Sinai. We, we continue to make steps away from God. Making steps away from Him. Now the second point follows closely on the first. And that is, the darkness is not just out there. 
The darkness is not just swirling out there. Some of it gets in here, doesn't it? Right? I mean, I don't need the Bible to tell me that. I only have to look in the mirror to know that. I know the darkness that's here within we impact the gay and the third. To this, Jesus says, be on guard. Be on guard. Lest your heart fall through drunkenness and dissipation and through the worries of this life. And the day of the Lord catch you like a trap. Be on guard. Jesus says, be awake. Come awake to your life. Confess our sins. Come before the throne of grace. Erat let him eradicate the darkness. At another time, you know, it's, Jesus said this, everyone the Father gives to me will come to me. I will never turn away anyone who comes to me. Now that is knocking on the door of the gospel, isn't it? I don't want to turn away anyone that comes to me. But we have to make steps to the one who can save us, right? We have to, we have to be pointed in that direction for the darkness. We were not meant to live in darkness. We were meant to live in light. Now the third point I'll make is the most hopeful and the most helpful. It comes directly from the Gospel reading. Where Jesus says, when you see the Son of Man coming in power and great glory. When you see the Son of Man coming in power and great glory. When you see the Son of Man coming in power and great glory. Look up. Look up. Turn your faces upward for your redemption is near. See, here is the core of the good news of Jesus Christ. And I hope you'll hear me on this one point. Here is the core. God through Christ makes up the distance between the two of us. We don't make up the distance. God makes up the distance. That's the promise of Jesus Christ. We may look at our world, we may look at ourselves and say, oh my goodness, all is lost. I cannot get well. Not so. Not so. Through, it, through Christ, God takes steps and bridges the distance between himself and us. Now that is really good news. When we're unable to help ourselves, when we've fallen off, when we've fallen way, way off the wagon, He comes to us and He even bridges the gap. It's a beautiful story, isn't it? And it is the truth, I promise you. That is the truth. And once, once we accept that, once we step into His love, once we step into the love that He's given us, we can finally be the women and men we were born to be. There is a dream that God is dreaming. It is you and me. It is singular. It is wonderful. It cannot be duplicated. It's only God's dream manifest in you and me. Look up, says Jesus. Your redemption is drawing near. I am making up the distance. You do not have to live in the stars. So really, the only step we need to make is the one of reception. Receiving what God has for us in Jesus Christ. That is the message of Advent. I can tell you it makes a world of difference. I saw it played out as if on a theater screen while Kay and I were in France. By now, surely you know that one of the accomplices, one of the conspirators, was a beautiful, a radiantly beautiful young woman, 26 years old, right? You saw that, oh, beautiful woman. Her last act, her last act was to explode the the uh, the, uh, the uh, explosives around her and kill everyone, friends and foe who was around her, right there in that apartment building. That was her last act. But the the part that's so disturbing about this young woman is that he, up to a year ago she was just a fun, giddy, twenty-five year old post adolescent woman, doing the things that girls do. Interviewing her neighbors, they all loved her. Her family adored her. Then something happened a year ago, and she became dark, and no one could figure it out. She took a step in the wrong place, such that her last act was so heinous, it was monstrous. Think about it. Her last act was not just to destroy herself, 
the, the gift that God had given to her. But she had to destroy others at the same time. Two policemen were killed. 26 years old. Where we step makes all the difference in the world. We can step toward God and receive what He has for us. We can step away from Him and become the very thing we loathe. We become the very thing we loathe. Now, at the same time, there was a 26-year-old girl on our little ship. She was from Alaska. And she reminded me of Lily and Chris Benton, just a bullion, radiant, she had curly hair. And in the, in the spirit of our cruise, she, she wore a beret. And every time she walked into the dining room or the lounge or went on deck, the, it's like somebody turned the lights up. You know, you know that kind of person, right? That's the kind of person I'm talking about. 26 years old, full of life. But she'd been trained as a dancer, a very fine dancer. So every night we had a dance on shipboard. She chose to dance every single minute with men who had been widowed. Several men were on our cruise who were pretty dour. They had been on their, their past group cruise, had been, had been with their wives, they were coming back just to try to capture something that they had lost. And there was this tremendous pain that they would that, that they would exude. But not when she danced. You watch her dance with these men, and all the loneliness and the pain would just lift off their shoulders. Because of the way she had stepped. You see, that's what's before you and me today. That's what's before us. We can either we can either be frozen in our fear and our ignorance and slowly become the very things we despise. Or we can step into the love of God. And we can become luminous like that young woman on the shipboard. So that we're healing people through the dance that we offer.